Hello and welcome to the Vantage Seminar. I'm, I'm very happy today to have um, Oslam Ezer giving this talk uh, because during the very first few meetings of the Vantage Seminar, Oslam and I were watching them together from the same library room on campus. And now, um, even though we're many miles apart, um, I'm really happy that she can join us. And uh, her talk today will be about dynamical Bailey maps. So Oslam, is it all right for us to uh, video this seminar? Yes. Oh, great, we'll uh, go right ahead. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Drew, for uh, the invitation. Um, so here is a bit dark, it's 8 p.m. in Istanbul, uh, a little different than the US. Um, okay, so I'll be talking about dynamical belly maps today and actually mostly about their, um, well, I'll say things about dynamical belly maps and then talk about the color theory associated to these, uh, these maps. Okay, so first, let's say we have uh, a smooth projective curve over the complex numbers, we call that X, and uh, a belly map is an unconstant morphism F from this curve X to the projective line P1 that is branched exactly over zero one infinity. So here so far, I think the other speakers define these belly maps um, as um, the maps that are branched at most over zero one infinity, but here I'm just assuming that really the zero one infinity are the branch points. And um, I will say a belly map has genus zero if this curve X has genus zero. And uh, I'll be talking about the genus zero belly maps today. So we'll be looking at the maps F from P1 to P1. Okay, so what is a dynamical belly map? A dynamical belly map is the belly map F from the projective line to itself such that um, the set zero one infinity maps to uh, itself again. So as points zero one and infinity don't have to be fixed, but as a set, it just maps to itself again. So this makes sure that the iterates of this, uh, the dynamical belly maps are again belly maps. So the only branch points are again zero one infinity. So um, some examples. So the first example is f of x that equals to two x cubed plus three x squared. I think John Lloyd said this was his uh, favorite belly map. And uh, unfortunately this is not a dynamical belly map. Uh, but if you just change one sign and make it to f of x equals negative 2x cubed plus 3x squared, it becomes a dynamical belly map. So here, um, if you check, 0 goes to 0, 1 goes to 1, and infinity goes to infinity on this map. And on the first map, this condition fails. Um, so the second example is a degree 4 belly map. Um, so this is actually obtained by iterating a quadratic map, which is branched over zero and infinity. Um, or maybe zero and one, actually, I can't remember. So this f of x uh, here is uh, branched over zero and infinity again. And um, it has this nice property that zero goes to infinity, infinity goes to one, and one comes back to zero. So again, as I said, so one infinity is uh, is fixed. So uh, we have a dynamical belly map again. Okay. So why do we study dynamical belly maps? So as I said before, um, if you have a belly map, even if it's genus zero, um, if you compose them, uh, it's not guaranteed that it will be again uh, branched over zero, one, and infinity only. But if you look at the dynamical belly maps, then the iterations give belly maps again. And so then, um, so we can actually study these iterations and their dynamical behaviors. But what do I mean by that? Um, so for example, we can study uh, the classification of points according to their orbits, such as periodic points or periodic points of these uh, iterates. Um, uh, another, uh, maybe nice property is that the dynamical belly maps are post-critically finite, which means uh, that the orbit of each critical point is finite. And so I'm going to call these post-critical finite maps as PCF in short. And so the PCF maps have been interesting objects in arithmetic dynamics, and, uh, and we'll see shortly um, about them later. Um, so 
Importantly speaking, for these kind of maps, the PCF maps, the behavior of the orbits of critical points play a very important role in determining their dynamics. So, um, so for example, so for such maps, we can study these iterated monodromy groups and these arboreal representations, which I'll define later. And these uh, sort of galapiertical objects are basically determined by these uh, behavior of the orbits of the critical points. We'll see how. Okay, so then um, if you're not convinced enough, then I'm gonna give one more motivation maybe to study uh, uh, such gala groups associated to these iterates. Okay, so let's pick a polynomial f of x with integer coefficients and let's pick an a naught, an integer, and we consider the sequence a n defined as um, a n equals f of a n minus one. So I have a naught, I apply f to it, so I get a one, and then apply f again, a two, and so on. So I get the sequence of integers. Then once you have this sequence of integers, there are you know, um, some questions that you can ask. For example, the first one that comes to me is, are there any primes in this sequence? And um, once you find some primes, then you can ask, well, are there any, are there finitely many primes or infinitely many primes in this sequence? So that might be um, quite hard to answer. So for example, if you look at this example here, um, take the polynomial f as x squared minus 2x plus 2. Sorry. Let's take the polynomial f of x that equals to x squared minus 2x plus 2 and a naught equal to 3. Then we obtain the sequence of uh, Fermat numbers. So if a naught is 3, then um, a1 is, um, if I write this correctly, 9 minus 6 plus 2, so that's 5, so which is uh, 4 plus 1. And then I think A2 is um, 17. And so, so, and we know that in the sequence, just determining the number of primes can be quite hard. But maybe instead, um, we can study the natural density questions about the primes dividing this uh, sequence. So we're gonna look at the set P that has the prime integers such that P divides at least one term of the sequence a n. At least one n P will divide. And so then we can ask what is the natural density of the set P? Um, what do I mean by the natural density? So I'm looking at the cardinality of all the primes in the set P that are less than or equal to X and I'm dividing it by all the primes that are less than or equal to X and I'm taking the limit as X goes to infinity. So this problem was studied before Odoni, um, but I think Odoni was the first one who approached this problem uh, sort of using Gala theory. So he studied these, uh, what we call you now the arboreal representations and um, using, using these representations, he answered this uh, natural density problem for this polynomial, f of x equals x squared minus x plus one. And he showed that this density is zero. Okay, so that was just one motivation to study these groups and uh, we'll come back to that. Okay, so uh, the two speakers, Adre and John, uh, talked about generating systems and this on the font before me. So um, for the generating systems, let's say we have a Philly map of degree D, then uh, we call this triple sigma one, sigma two, sigma three. These are permutations in SD. Uh, and we call this a generating system of degree D if they satisfy the following properties. The product of these permutations, sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, should be identity. And the group G generated by these permutations inside the symmetric group on D letters acts transitively on one up to D. So we want this group uh, to be a transitive subgroup of SD. Okay, and we actually call this group uh, generated by these permutations, the monodromy group of F. This is the geometric monodromy group. All right, so using this generating system, we can also define what we call the combinatorial type 
of this generating system. So that's going to be a tuple. Instead of looking at these generators, sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, I'm going to look at them up the conjugacy. So I'm going to be looking at the conjugacy classes of each of these permutations. But D is again the degree of my belly map. And so one thing that we know here is that the conjugacy class of these permutations really is just determined by uh, when you write these permutations as product of these joint cycles, the length of each cycle that appear in this product, and also the, the number of uh, each disjoint cycle. So then uh, most of the time we can actually just represent this combinatorial type uh, by sequence of integers that denote the length of each cycle that appear in sigma i or each i. So for the dynamical belly maps that I'm going to be interested in, this combinatorial type will be uh, looking much nicer and so much easier description. We'll see in a minute. Okay, so I said we'll study the dynamical belly maps, but I like just a little bit. We're not going to be looking at all dynamical belly maps, but we're going to be looking at a special class of dynamical belly maps that I'm going to call normalized and single cycle. What does that mean? So I'm basically looking at um, the dynamical belly maps F from P1 to P1. So again, this means that F is branched over 0, 1 infinity, and also that 0, 1 infinity as a set maps to itself under F. So the first condition here is that F is normalized, which means that 0 maps to 0, 1 maps to 1, and infinity maps to infinity. Okay, so I'll call that the normalized condition. And the second condition is that above each branch point, I want a unique ramification point. So there is only one point that is allowed to ramify about each 0, 1, and infinity. And then I want that ramified point to be 0, 1, infinity again. So uh, we could also say that here for these kind of dynamical belly maps, then the branch points are 0, 1, infinity in the range, but also the critical points uh, in the domain are 0, 1, infinity. And uh, they map exactly to themselves. Okay, so then these are the the kind of maps that I want to be looking at. But um, I don't want to say every time that they're normalized and single cycle dynamical belly maps. So instead, I'm going to describe them by their combinatorial type because that gives a nice description. So again, we talked about the combinatorial type here of these generating systems. They were given by these conjugacy classes of these permutations in the generating system. So here, what happens is that the second condition that there's a unique ramification point about each of these zero one infinity makes sure that these sigma i's are single cycles. So that's where the, the name comes from. So if there are single cycles, then I can just describe their conjugacy class with uh, the length of each cycle. And the length of each cycle here ei's correspond to the ramification index of each ramified point, so 0, 1, infinity again. And the riemann hertz formula then says that um, for such maps, if we have this combinatorial type E1, E2, E3 for degree D, then uh, the sum of all these ramification indices gives you 2D plus 1, where D is the degree of the map. Okay. So then if I want to talk about these maps from now on, I'm just going to say that I'm looking at a normalized belly map of combinatorial type D, E1, E2, E3. And, uh, and I'm going to work with just general combinatorial type. I won't specify what these EIs are, um, and it won't matter. OK, so then just in general, so so far we just defined this combinatorial type for these uh, belly maps. But then in general, we can define what is an abstract combinatorial type of genus zero. That's just this information we have that D and these three numbers, E1, E2, and E3, such that they satisfy these properties. So their sum is 2D plus one, and that each EI is between two and D, and they can be equal to two or D. So then, um, then we can say that for each abstract combinatorial type of genus zero, uh, there is a unique normalized belly map, F from P1 to P1. So it's unique and normalized with the given combinatorial type. And it's unique, it's normalized. So that's really the map that we're looking for here. 
And this map, we know the one exists, is actually defined over Q. It can be defined over Q. So then that's nice. Okay, so I know that um, I can just describe these maps by their combinatorial types, and that I know that they will be defined over Q. Okay, so, um, but what are these maps? What do they look like? Uh, so far, I've given you uh, one example in degree three only. So let's just look at more examples. Okay. So the first example is what I've told you before, the f of x equals negative two x cubed plus b x squared. So this is in degree three and the ramification index of um, zero uh, is two. I'm gonna call them instead of e1, e2, well, let's write e1, e2, e3. So E1 is the ramification index of zero, that's two. And uh, E2 is the ramification index of one, that's two again. And E3 is three. So that's the ramification index of infinity. So this equals to the degree. So that makes this into a polynomial. Okay, so that's a nice example in degree three. And what else can we say? So we can actually just, um, just from this polynomial, we can produce uh, a family of maps in any degree D by changing this degree three to any degree D and fixing E1 equals to, to two. And I'm gonna be looking at again polynomials. So I want the E3 to be D again. So what do they look like? So here I extended this family to any degree D where ramification index over zero is still two. And um, the condition that the sum of these ramification indices uh, is 2D plus one makes sure that uh, E2 is D minus one. And then you can actually just write down this family over here. As you see that when D equals three, you get exactly the example that I gave you on number one. Okay, so, so far these families were very simple to write. And uh, we have another family here where I change E1. So here in this example, I fixed E1 as two, and here I'm changing E1 also to, um, to anything. So I fixed that to D minus K for K varying. And so then again, I'm looking at the polynomials. So E3 equals to D. So then this makes sure that E2 equals to K plus one. And in this case, you can still write down these polynomials and explicitly the coefficients of this polynomial. Um, it's, it doesn't look as nice as number two, I think, but still pretty good, uh, easy to write down. And, um, and these are nowhere, uh, these are very easy to write down uh, and also, I think to prove, so not very difficult. So one more example here. So this is another family where D and K can vary, um, but this time the difference is here, this is not a polynomial. So this is a rational family of uh, dynamical value maps that are normalized and single cycle. Okay, so, um, so what we see here is that E1 equals E3. That's the family we looked at. And when E1 equals E3, somehow you see a symmetry between the numerator, the coefficients of the numerator here and the denominator, the sort of reverse order. Um, okay, so these are some families and you can just you know pick K and D and just write down these examples of polynomials and national maps explicitly. What is this good for? Um, it's good when you don't know what you want to prove. So you, you know you just write down examples very easily, and then you ask magma sort of what's going on, and you get a lot of um, ideas about in general what should happen, and that's what happened to us. So it's always good to uh, compute some examples. Okay, so uh, hopefully these are enough examples, and now we can talk about these uh, the monodromy groups that I mentioned uh, in the first slide. So we have a belly map F, although um, the belly maps that I believe I'll be looking at are all defined over Q. I still define this over, um, over some number field K. So we have a belly map from P1 to P1 defined over K. And then uh, let, let's fix an algebraic closure, Q bar of Q, and that's also the algebraic closure of K. And um, let's say F naught is the function field um, of P1. So that's K of T. And then we'll be looking at the extension Fn of F0. 
corresponding to the map, the iteration P1 to P1. Uh, so I iterate F n times by itself. So I get this map and then, uh, and then I get this uh, function field extension Fn. And then I define the Galois group G and Q, okay, as the Galois group of the normal closure. So this Fn here corresponds to this map. And then I have Fn tilde that extending it. So this is the normal closure of Fn. So you can also think of this field as um, I'm looking at the nth iteration of f of x, and I set it equal to uh, t, and I just add all the roots of this polynomial to f0, and so I get this fn tilde. And then when I look at the Galois group of fn tilde over f0, then I get this Galois group that I denote by g and q. So I write here q because I started with, uh, actually it should be k, sorry. So you either change this Q to K or maybe just change this K to Q. That will be easier. Okay, so we're just working over Q. So that I have this G and Q, the Gala group of this, and I'm gonna call this the arithmetic monodromic group. Maybe the iterated arithmetic monodromic group. And I'll explain why it's called arithmetic. Then um, we can similarly define G and Q bar as, so instead of looking at this Fn tilde, I'm gonna tensor that with the algebraic closure of Q, and then I'm gonna be looking at this as an extension of Q bar of T instead of Q of T. So here, this is Q of T, and then I'm gonna be looking over here, um, over Q bar of T. And then I look at the Galois group of this field extension, and I call that G and Q bar. And as you can guess here, this one was called arithmetic monodromic groups of F. And then here, this one is called the geometric monodromic groups of F. So here I define them in terms of just Gala groups, but we can actually define these uh, as quotients of the fundamental group. So the reason why we call this the geometric monodromic group, uh, G and Q bar, is that um, it actually just comes from something very geometric. So uh, we look at these maps just over C. Since we work over the algebraic closure of Q, then we can sort of picture it as we're working over C. And then we can imagine what the monodromy does. So I'm, be, I'm looking at the fundamental group of P1 over QR minus 0, 1, infinity. I'm taking as 0, 1, infinity because those are the branch points. And I have a base point T. So I have this space. This is my P1 minus zero one infinity. And I have this space point. So I have these loops around zero, one and infinity. These are the points that I take up. So then these are the generators of the fundamental group. So I'm gonna call them gamma zero, gamma one and gamma infinity. And then so we can picture what this, uh, uh, what this group G and Q bar corresponds to here. So what it does is I have this, and iterate of f coming from again p1, then uh, what happens here is that this gamma zero or gamma one or gamma infinity, whichever you want to take, then this, once you fix an inverse image of t here, so I'm going to call that t1, then gamma zero lifts to a unique path up to homotopy. And, um, and the end point of this path, so I'm going to call this gamma zero tilde, the endpoint of this path will be unique. So then, but since this is a loop down here, then the endpoint and the beginning, these will be both in the fiber of T. So in this um, inverse image of T in this set. So then this gives you an action, just the lifting these generators of the fundamental group gives you an action of this fiber under FNs. So then, uh, and that's what we describe over here. And so you can see also the G and Q bar as the uh, image of this representation. And naturally, since um, F has degree D, uh, F to the N has degree D to the N. So then you see this automorphism uh, group inside the symmetric group on D to the N letters. Okay, so then 
Um, we cannot quite see the same picture over Q, but we can still describe this GNQ as the quotient of the etal fundamental group over uh, of P1Q minus 0, 1 infinity. So we can still do the same construction. So we can sort of see them as the, you know, very related to their quotient of fundamental groups, which is also nice, I think. Um, so here then we see both of these groups, GNQ and GNQ bar inside this huge symmetric group, but we'll see in a bit that these groups are actually too big to consider these in. So we'll, we'll find something smaller inside the symmetric group that contains both of these groups. Okay, so, uh, so far we defined these groups, right? The geometric and the arithmetic monodromy groups for uh, any n. And taking limits, we can also describe um, G infinity Q bar and G infinity Q, respectively. And, and they actually fit into this nice exact sequence um, that G infinity Q bar is seen as uh, a normal subgroup of G infinity Q. And then the quotient of G infinity Q by G infinity Q bar is this Galois group corresponding to some algebraic extension of this field K. And so this field K, you can just forget about it and say Q, I think it's a typo. So then, um, well, one nice or natural question is, what is this field L? Uh, is it finite or infinite or can we describe it for certain maps? I think that's an interesting question to ask. And we don't really know so much about it, except uh, a few examples that I'll mention later. But we know that for quadratic maps, this L can be infinite or finite. So there are both cases that happen. OK, um, maybe I'll stop here and ask if there are any questions. I'll continue. I have a question. So, I mean, are, if you pick like a, a cyclic group or a particular finite group, I mean, have people found polynomials that realize those Gawa groups? As the monodromy group? Yeah. Um, I think that's doable. I'm not sure. Um, just like finding, just give, if you give me one group, can I find an F that uh, takes that monodromy group? I think that's, well, for certain groups, for cyclic groups, I think it should be doable. But I'm not, I don't know, I don't know. Thanks. Okay, so we defined the, um, uh, these monodromy groups. Um, so John White also talked about this uh, kind of in his talk. And um, so he mentioned that sort of we can see these Gala groups, G infinity Q bar and G infinity Q um, sort of as like the generic Gala group, like what it should be for a generic value for G infinity Q. So here, if you, so instead of working over this T, if you just pick a specific value for that, um, so I call that A here, if you take a rational number that is not zero or one, and um, then we can consider the following Galois groups, G and A, where it's the Galois group of this field extension where I adjoin all the roots of uh, the nth iteration of F that equals to A. Okay, so I do the same thing, but I just pick a special value um, for T. So we can look at these Galois groups and then we can do the same construction taking the inverse limit. We can look at G infinity A. So we get this huge infinite group. Um, and what we know is that for a dense subset of P1Q to minus zero one, um, these two Galois groups will be equal, G and A and G and Q. So, so far what we know is these Galois groups G and A will be a subset of G and Q and then G and Q bar is inside G and Q. And um, so this is a normal subgroup inside here. So what we want to do now is, um, well, first of all, describe this group first, the geometric monodromy group. Uh, we can do this by writing down a generating system and actually computing and doing Galois theory, uh, doing group theory. And then uh, from that, we're going to talk about the arithmetic monodromy group and the conditions when these two are equal. And then once we figure that condition out, then we're going to be looking at the special values 
of A such that these two gamma groups are equal. So I'm going to describe some conditions on A uh, such that this equality holds for the dynamic ability maps that I, uh, I talked about before. OK, so first we said that we, you can see these groups all inside the symmetric group on D to the N letters, but instead we're going to be looking at them inside automorphism group of some tree that we construct this way. Um, so we construct the tree with root T here, or if you like, you can take it as root A uh, for some rational number away from zero and one. And uh, so this is going to be a DRE rooted tree. And so, and each vertex of this tree will be the root of this uh, polynomial f and x minus t. And so here, for example, I draw a tree for d equals three. So I have three leaves at each level, and uh, I have this root t. So here, these three points will be the roots of f of x minus t. And then for each of these points, let's say these are t1, t2, t3, then I'll be looking at these points as f of x equals t1 or f of x equals t2. And so I construct this huge tree. And uh, what we can do is that we can embed our Gala groups that we want to study, um, all of them, inside, well, under some identifications, of course, inside this uh, automorphism group of this tree. So when I say Tn here, I'm talking about the tree with level n. So for example, here, I draw the tree with level three. So level one, level two, and level three. And in general, you can do this for any n, and you can also just take this to infinity. So maybe a couple of nice things about these automorphism groups. These live in the in the big symmetric group, but um, they're much smaller. And we have some properties like if you have n greater than or equal to m, then you can have a projection map from the automorphism group of Tn to automorphism group of Tm, which means that I can sort of um, I can sort of ignore, forget about the the vertices above level m when I do this projection. So I'm restricting my tree to a lower level. And then the second property is that something about the structure of this automorphism group. The automorphism group is given by this reef product of the automorphism group of Tn minus one. So uh, um, with the symmetric group SD. So I'm going to have a maybe better way of writing this. So this reef product means this. The semi-direct product of this direct product of automorphism group of Tn minus one by itself d times, okay, so we have this direct product here, which is, you know, easy structure, and then I'm taking the semi-direct product of that with SD, so that's what it means here. So what are these Tn minus ones? So this SD is, I'm just looking at the first level, and so the SD is corresponding to the permutations on level one, so here is SD, and these automorphism of Tn minus ones are the subtrees rooted at level one. So here, the first one is corresponding to the automorphism group of this subtree, and then the second one here, and then the third one is here. And in general, I can do this for any D, the picture only shows it for D equals three. So then since this is the group structure, I'm gonna be describing, or just using the notation for the elements of these automorphisms as sigma one, sigma D times tau. So these sigma i's come from these automorphism groups and tau comes from SD. Okay, so well, what matter for us is that these Galois groups will be seen inside the automorphism group of this tree Tn. So what do we know already about these groups? Um, so for example, for quadratic polynomials, we, uh, we know that the iterated monodromy groups, the geometric and the arithmetic both, are studied by Pink. And he also studied the uh, quadratic non-PCF rational maps. So not necessarily polynomials, but they're not PCFs. So the critical orbit, uh, the orbit of each critical point is infinite. Actually not each, but uh, at least one of them is infinite. And so those are all studied by Pink. So that requires lots of group theory. But one nice thing about these is uh, that he, doesn't use any explicit uh, map and he doesn't do this for Q. He actually does this for any field of characteristic not two. And he only looks at 
the, uh, the, the combinatorial type of the critical orbit. In this case, just determine everything. So this is at least true for uh, quadratic maps. Um, it may not be quite true for general, but we don't really know so much in general for arbitrary degree D maps. Okay, so those are the monodromy groups. And um, so for arbitrary representations for these specific values of A, then uh, Stoll studied these maps, F of X equals X squared plus C. So here, um, I think he gave conditions, some congruence conditions on C uh, such that the corresponding Abriel Gala representations are surjective onto these automorphism group of the tree. Okay. Um, but I, as far as I know, for example, that the corresponding question for f of x equals x squared plus p. So here, by the way, I'm taking a equals to zero. Um, for this, it's still not. Um, known if the corresponding Gala group is uh, the infinite Gala group corresponding to this for a equals zero is finite index or not. It's expected to be finite index. Okay, um, so one more example. This is the one that I uh, talked about before, the cubic uh, degree three dynamical belly map, negative two x cubed plus three x squared. Um, so this was studied by Benedetto, Faber, Hoots, Jewel, and Yasufuku. Um, and uh, so this is the first example of a dynamical belly map you consider. And uh, for this cubic polynomial, they figured out the, the monodromy groups, the arithmetic and the geometric one, and also the conditions on A such that uh, these three Gala groups are all equal. So it was just done for this, uh, this degree three map. And so what we have done um, is, Sort of generalize this result to um, any normalized belly map of combinatorial type D, E1, E2, E3. So here EIs can be anything and D can be any degree. And um, so what we basically use here for this map is that if you look at the critical points, the orbits look like this. Well, we have zero, zero is fixed. We have one, one is fixed. And we have infinity, infinity is fixed. And so here for these maps, this picture doesn't change. So these normalized belly maps that we use, again, the ramification indices are different, E1, E2, and E3, of course. Um, but here, we still have the picture that zero maps to itself, one maps to itself, and infinity map to itself. So that's the, the picture of the orbit. Okay, so what do we do for this? We first compute the geometric monodromy group. How do we do that? Okay, so to begin with, we already know what happens for F. For F, this G1 Q bar is uh, done by Liu and Osserman. And um, that we know that it's either the symmetric group on D letters or the alternating group on D letters. So it's quite large to begin with. And we know that it's SD if one of the ramification indices EI is even, and if they're all odd, then it's the alternating group. Okay, so um, then what we do is uh, what happens next when we iterate F with itself. So for that, you first write down the generating system uh, for the iterates of F and then compute the group that they generate. So in the case that, uh, and in the first level, we have alternating group, then we can show that for any n, this iterate will be the leaf product of the alternating group AD with itself. So this basically says that if you start with AD, then this is as large as possible for any n. So it cannot be really any bigger than this. And if you start with SD, so that's the other case, G1 Q bar is SD, then G2 Q bar, at level two, we get an index two subgroup of automorphism group of T2. And then for any n bigger than that, it's as large as possible allowed by this, uh, this index two subgroup. But what do I mean by this? If you look at this picture for D equals three and level two, um, we define this map sine two 
But I take an automorphism, as I said, the automorphism corresponds to an automorphism of this subtree, so sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three, and then something acting on uh, here on the first level. So I take an element like this and I send it to, so this is the usual sign function on uh, the symmetric group. So I take it to the sine of tau in SD times the product of sine of sigma i's. So what happens here is that um, this is a homomorphism and it gives you, uh, and if you look at its kernel, then your Galois group stays inside this kernel. So it gives you an index two subgroup of the uh, automorphism group of T2. And then, and then you show that by uh, sort of by induction, studying the kernel of the projection from Gn to Gn minus one, uh, you show that it's as large as possible given G2 Q bar. Okay, so then uh, this is maybe the uh, only case that we actually completely know what uh, the, the monodromic group really looks like. And I think the, the reason why we get something nice, like uh, in terms of the description of this group, um, nice like this, not just computing the order or like elements or the order of the elements, but actually we have a nice description for the group is that uh, the map is normalized. Okay, so once we have this, then the question again is, what is the arithmetic monodromic group? Can they be equal? Are they different? Or for what kind of maps are they equal? Um, so maybe just to give examples, they can be quite different already on the first level. So if you start with a map uh, where the geometric monodromic group is AD, the alternating group, then you can definitely find examples like that where the arithmetic monodromic group is the symmetric group SD. But for our maps, we show that that G and Q bar equals to G and Q if and only if they're equal on the second level. So this is actually the case for G1 is SD. I'm cheating a little bit. Um, so, well, how do I check this condition that G2 Q bar equals G2 Q um, here? So what we do is, since we know that this G2 Q bar is determined by this map sine two, and that just considers these subtrees, uh, we define a discriminant according to that. So I don't wanna get into too much details here, only if you ask, um, but what we do is basically, when the degree D is odd, this, kernel of this map sine two corresponds to, if you just look at the permutations in this uh, in this Galois group, just sort of looking at the vertices at level N. So you see it uh, inside the symmetric group SD to the N, and then you take the sine function on that. So then looking at uh, the kernel of sine two, when D with D is odd, it's the same thing as staying inside the alternating group. But we know that if a group is a subgroup of the alternating group, then that means the discriminant being a square in certain field. But then when D is even, it's not quite the same thing. So then we're trying to define the right discriminant so that we can um, accommodate this uh, kernel of sine two condition. And so then we define this product discriminant and then we get this condition to check whether our group is really the kernel of sine two or not. So then we can check this condition by computing this discriminant if it is a square in Q of T or not. And then um, this formula, we can actually just write it down explicitly in terms of coefficients. So it's not so hard to check. Okay, so then we actually know when they're equal and, uh, and we can say for the members of the families that I mentioned before, which ones are um, actually satisfying this equality and which ones are not. And in general, if you remember this exact sequence that I gave you before, um, what we know is that this L for the normalized dynamical value maps that, um, that we look at, this L is at most of degree two. Even if at level two, these groups are not equal. So at level N, they're not equal, but still uh, the index is at most two. So it doesn't really grow much. Okay, so then the last thing is, we'll be looking at um, some rational number A, that is not zero or one. And then we consider these G and A, these uh, specialized Galois groups or the algorithm representations. And then we want to know when this actually equals to um, G and Q or G and Q bar. 
So for that, we show that A needs to satisfy these properties. So there has to be some primes P, Q1, Q2, and Q3 in Q, such that when I do reduce F modulo P, I get this monomial of degree D. So I call this condition the good monomial reduction. The good part comes from keeping the degree D and, it, and it's a monomial, so it's a good monomial reduction at P. And uh, the second condition says that at these primes, Q1, Q2, and Q3, we want good separable reduction such that the following uh, valuation conditions are satisfied. Then we can actually say that G and A contains G and Q bar. And in general, if these two Gala groups are equal, then these three are equal. So what are these conditions? What do they really say? And why do we need them? Is, um, okay. So the first condition, the good monomial reduction is necessary to do um, an Eisenstein condition. And so far, uh, so to prove the irreducibility of the corresponding polynomials or the numerator of f and x minus a. And so that, that gives us uh, the degree d each time we adjoin a root of f and x minus a. And then the second condition is the good separable reduction. This basically makes sure that uh, when we reduce f at these primes, qi's, when we have good separable reduction, then f bar, the reduction has the same combinatorial type. And so that allows us to sort of lift um, and show the existence of prime ideals in these tower of field extensions that we have so that these prime ideals, the ramification of these prime ideals are, uh, is exactly the same as the ramification of the zero one infinity in the original map P1 to P1. So once we have these prime ideals, then these basically we compute the generators of these inertia groups corresponding to these prime ideals. And so then uh, those allow us to generate this group G and Q bar inside GNA. And, um, and in an earlier paper, we actually just described conditions on when F has good separable reduction at a prime and when F has a good monomial reduction at P. So we actually know explicitly um, conditions on how to get these. Okay, um, so that's the Arbor uh, representations. That's the conditions we get. And as the last thing, we can get some dynamical application. So this is related to the um, natural density of these prime sets that I talked about earlier. Um, so there's some conditions here, but if you take a B naught that is not zero or one, a rational number, and then you form the sequence, you get bi's by applying f to bi minus one. And then you can show that the set of prime divisors of the sequence has natural density zero. Under some conditions like um, you have this normalized building map f such that these Gala groups that we talked about are equal for all n. Um, and also you need this condition sort of for each point in the pre-image of zero over here then you can show the, uh, the natural density zero as well. Okay, I talked a lot. Uh, I'll finish here. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Aslan. All right, well, this would be a great time for some questions. Sorry, can you go back to the last slide? Um, the dynamics? This one, yeah, yeah. So, so can, can you just say a little bit more about what the link is between these two, you know, the, having a full Galois group and having not a lot of prime divisors, you know, why, why these two things uh, relate to each other? Um, yeah, so, so I think what we do is, um, so looking at the density of the set, so I'm gonna call this the prime divisors of the, the set S. So looking at this uh, density, um, we can show somehow that this is uh, less than or equal to the density of, so you relate this to the set where you have um, F and X 
minus a has a rational root. And then uh, once we have this correspondence, then this having a rational root here uh, means that you're looking at the Galois group that you computed, this uh, GQA, and then you're looking at, um, so I'm gonna call that, uh, let's see, GNA, G infinity A. So GNA, and you're looking at GNA fix, which means that you're looking at the automorphisms inside this Galois group fixing at least one leaf. Mm -hmm. And so it's not actually enough to just compute the Galois group. You also compute this, uh, the proportion of these automorphisms that are fixing one, uh, one leaf at least inside the whole Galois group. And then we show that sort of this divided by the GNA, we show that this actually goes to zero. And since that goes to zero, this prime density also uh, goes to zero. All right, thank you.